Bienville may mean good town in French, but Louise Pete was everything but that. Louise Pete, who lived in Bienville, began as a petty robber, sex worker, and small-time con artist before turning to serial murder. She was one of just four women to enter the gas chamber in California. So what brought her there? And what was the crime that she committed? Hello, and welcome to another video. Today, we will be sharing a unique crime story of a female serial killer who murdered and caused the deaths of others. Before we go on, as always, we would appreciate it if you would give this video a like, subscribe, and ensure that the notification bell is turned on for more in-depth real crime sagas like this. Let's jump right in. Louise Pete, who portrayed herself as a gentle and calm soul who avoided confrontation, was convincingly ruthless, utilizing her manners and charm to deceive and lure potential victims. In reality, she was a cold-blooded killer, fraudster, and sociopath who murdered for money. One of the sadder aspects about Pete was that she had no real reason to do what she did. She came from a wealthy family, the daughter of a newspaper owner. She didn't live in the kind of desperate conditions that could easily explain her misdeeds. Her first marriage was in 1903 to traveling salesman Henry Bosley. Sadly, Henry killed himself after discovering her in bed with another man. Another move was required, this time to Shreveport, Louisiana. For the following few years, Pete maintained herself as an expensive upper-class sex worker. A slew of wealthy and respectable people became her clients and financed her lifestyle. They too were her victims. Pete stole from them whenever she could, knowing full well that they would not report the thefts. After a few years in the South, she decided to seek out other hunting grounds. Shreveport was exploited like a gold mine. Even calling herself Louise Gold hadn't stopped her from becoming well-known in Shreveport. Pete then moved to the Elite Society of Boston, Massachusetts in 1911. Boston's affluent, apparently respectable gentlemen were frequently as private as Shreveport's, making them equally prone to seduction, thievery, and blackmail. Pete was betting well that they were more concerned about avoiding embarrassment in the society pages of Boston's new papers. She was correct once more. When she was ultimately caught, it was in private rather than in public. To avoid shame, the families and the Boston Police Department just let her leave town for a fresh start in another region. Her next stop would be Waco, Texas. So would oil millionaire Joseph Appel. Appel was affluent and readily available, making him ideal prey for Pete. He was also an attempted rapist, according to Louise, so she shot him in self-defense only a week after they met. Relocating once more, the Dallas heiress arrived in Dallas in 1913. Another death would be the result. Harry Ferrote was her second spouse, and he was the second to commit suicide. Louise's continuous infidelity also ruined Ferrote, who shot himself. Louise's next stop was Denver, Colorado. There, Lofi Louise Pressler and her several names eventually became Louise Pete for the first time legally. Her brief marriage to salesman Richard Pete was marked by regular squabbles in the birth of her only child, Frances Ann. After becoming married in 1916, the pair fought often, and their marriage ended in 1920. Louise then relocated from Denver to Los Angeles, leaving both her daughter and her ex-husband behind. Denton, a retired and extremely wealthy mining engineer, lived in Los Angeles. Denton had amassed a substantial fortune in the mining industry, and Louise was well aware of it. They became acquainted quickly, yet it was never verified that they were lovers. It didn't matter to Louise. Jacob Denton was prey worth catching. He was also deserving of death. In May of 1920, Louise moved into Denton's luxurious residence on Wilshire Boulevard, an affluent neighborhood. 
Denton, wanting to rent out the property while in Denver on business, surprisingly rented it to her for $75 a week, significantly less than the $350 he had previously requested. Denton vanished in early June. Louise had just been there a week and had been differently labeled as his tenant, housekeeper, and girlfriend. She soon began taking advantage of Denton, making money for herself. She forged Denton's signature, withdrew $300 from his bank, and gained access to his safe deposit box only three days after his disappearance. Part of the $300 was most likely paid to the gardener, who brought a huge amount of earth to the basement rather than the garden. Louise had informed him that she was cultivating mushrooms down there. Her access to the safe deposit box produced complications, particularly when a bank employee questioned her signature. Louise's tale was that Denton had been attacked by a mysterious woman who had hacked off his signing arm with a sword was at best flimsy. If the initial deception was bad, telling multiple versions to different individuals was far worse. Denton's pals were curious as to what had happened to him. Was he truly recovering and embarrassed to go in public, as Louise claimed? Or was there something considerably deeper going on that they weren't aware of? Denton's daughter went beyond simply asking questions. Suspicious, she engaged a lawyer to find out the facts. Pete performed poorly under interrogation once more, and the lawyer was completely suspicious. Meanwhile, Pete began wasting Denton's money by driving his car, pawning his jewelry and possessions, and renting out mansion rooms. Denton's daughter wasted no time in having the house searched, including the basement, rumored to be the location of Pete's mushroom growing. Investigators discovered earth, but no mushrooms inside a wooden cubicle. They also discovered Jacob Denton's rotting body, complete with his allegedly missing limb. His body had been wrapped in a quilt and stuffed inside the box after being shot in the head and strangled. Louise Pete was now wanted for murder, and she would soon face her accusers. Louise's first murder trial in California made headlines. The sentence was relatively light. California was never afraid to hang murderers, but women were the exception rather than the rule. Superior Court Judge Frank Willis sentenced her to life in prison. He refused to hang her because the prosecution's case was primarily circumstantial and the state had a long history of not executing women. Richard Pete was upset. Despite their history, he always maintained his wife's innocence, even after she ordered him to divorce her and start again. It was too much when she abruptly cut off contact after he declined. Richard Pete, who was depressed and distraught, shot himself in a hotel in Tucson, Arizona in 1924. Pete was imprisoned at San Quentin, then in Tehachapi Women's Prison. The 18 years in Tehachapi were spent as a model inmate with a spotless record. Thus, she left prison on parole in 1939. She quickly returned to her shady ways. Emily Latham, Pete's probation officer, took her in before dying of a heart attack in 1943. Arthur and Margaret Logan took her place as Louise's benefactors. The Logans were exceptionally gracious, even caring for her daughter, Frances, following Richard Pete's unexpected death. Pete went on to marry banker Lee Borden Judson in late April 1943, who had no knowledge that she was a convicted murderer. It was Louise's final marriage, and Margaret Logan was her final victim. Pete launched a whispering campaign against Arthur Logan, who was suffering from dementia almost immediately. Margaret Logan mysteriously departed only a month after Pete arrived. Pete admitted Arthur to Patton State Hospital within days, alleging that he was violent and uncontrollable. The Judsons occupied the Logan house for six months. By the time Arthur died in December 1944, the Judsons were living comfortably, although Lee Judson had received no satisfactory answers to his queries about Margaret Logan's disappearance. 
he was still unaware that he had married a murderer or that Margaret Logan was buried on the compound. Judson's domestic happiness was about to come crashing down around him when the bank uncovered falsified checks in Margaret's name and dated after her disappearance, cops arrived at the house promptly. The police examined the home, knowing Louise's background, and discovered Margaret Logan buried under an avocado tree in the garden. Lethal Louise had murdered again after just serving an 18-year sentence for her prior crimes. She was caught instantly, and the courts in California showed no mercy this time. Judson leapt off the Spring Arcade building in Los Angeles, unable to bear the embarrassment. On April 23, 1945, Louise's final murder trial began. The outcome was almost unquestionable. Prosecutors alleged that Louise had murdered Margaret Logan after being apprehended for faking Logan's checks. On May 31, 1945, Louise was convicted by a jury of 11 women and one man. For her, the date was a bad omen. Superior Court Judge Harold Landreth sentenced Pete to death on June 1, 1945, exactly one year after Logan's murder. She was sent back to Tehachapi, her previous prison. Louise's stay this time was short. Despite her best efforts, her court-appointed lawyers faced an impossible assignment with appeals courts pronouncing her trial fair and verdict just. Louise's history did her no favors. Having obtained mercy just to kill again spoke volumes about her. All was lost by the time she arrived at the gas chamber on April 11, 1947. What do you think made Louise Pete love the life of crime and violence? Do you think she deserved a third chance? Tell us what you think in the comments section below. As always, thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.